Welcome to the realm of magic and mystery, classic horror and sci-fi. You are now entering the House of the Unusual podcast with your hosts, Eddie and Joe. Welcome, everyone. I am your host, Joe Pavlansky, pop culture historian, writer for Scary Monsters magazine, and curator of the Crypt of Classics. Co-hosting, as always, is the maestro of Mail Order Mysteries and owner of HouseOfTheUnusual.com, the one, the only, Eddie Guevara. How are you doing tonight, Eddie? Hi, Joe. How are you? Good. Um, so we got a, a big, big show planned for tonight. We are going to cover our top 10 movies. Now, I know this could get could get kind of tough, you know, in the, the top 10, at least for me, might change from week to week, you know, except for my number one and twos. But, you know... It, they could fluctuate depending on how I'm feeling, but I, I got a list together and we're going to go through them, discuss them a little bit and let everyone know a little bit about these movies, how they might affect affected us and, and why we, we hold them so dear. So if you want to start off, go ahead and give us your number 10. All right, Joe, my, my number 10 out now, the list for me could be different. Like you said, it could change over time. I do the one and two tend to hold on to that. Um, but there are so many good films I've seen. And I could tell you this much that a while back, I actually purchased, uh, I think it was like 50 or 100 of the old 1940s and 50s B movies. You know, there were horror movies, sci-fi movies. Oh, excellent. I bought the different, yeah, I bought the different sets. Um, they were for sale. I think it was Walmart or, or FYI before they started going out of business. But I can tell you something, though, that I saw some of those films that what I would do is each and every night, I did this for several months. I got, um, my wife gave me, I think it was a seven inch, yeah, seven inch DVD player. And I would go to sleep. Now, what I would do is as I'm going to sleep on, on the bed, I would put it right on top of my chest. And as I watched it in the dark, it felt like I was watching it in a movie theater because, of course, I'm seeing the screen, not seven inches, but I'm seeing a huge screen in front of me. Nice. Now, the thing that's interesting with that is that I did get into this genre of old 1950s films that they were fantastic, man. Some of them were so phenomenal, even though the, I mean, the time they made it, it, it was, you know, they didn't have the same as, as a, you know, FX we have today, but they were really good. So I'm going to start with a mix of, of some old films, and I did throw one newer film in there. Uh, which, you know, it, it's it's a newer film. But anyway, here's my, my number 10. I'm going to start from the bottom up. Is Earth versus the Flying Saucer. Now, in Earth versus the Flying Saucer, what I liked about the film is the way it was done. And I will say two things. One is, I did notice at the time, um, the graphics for the film were, I think advanced for its time because they show flying saucers. They're going over the white house lawn and, you know, they're so realistic. It's crazy. Such an iconic, uh, uh it is. you know, Film. scene too. Yes, it is. And, and that's, you know, I also enjoyed a lot about earth versus the flying saucer was the fact that it kind of resembled, uh, the earth stood still. I think it kind of had the same similar effect as the day the earth stood still, the original one with uh, Rennie. Um, Cause you know, it was kind of filmed in, in the same way, but um, I, I loved it. That's, that's the one that you give number 10 for you. All right. My number 10 is now, now, like you said, I, I have a lot of different movies on here, a lot of different um, decades, but I, I kind of, you know, threw it together and I was trying to think, you know, what I would really, you know, what do I really enjoy watching and what would I, and what have I watched over and over? So my number 10 is going to be the 1978 Superman movie with Christopher Reeves. Now I remember watching this movie back in probably the mid eighties. And I, I don't even think I was a comic book fan at that time. I think I was, you know, myself and my father were collecting, uh, baseball and football other sports cards at the time but i really kind of fell in love with the movie it was it was just it was awesome you know the special effects you know weren't like something you would see today they were still you know very 
you know, infinite uh, in their age. But it was just, it was a great storyline. And I, I knew about Superman, but I, I didn't know too much about him. But when I seen Christopher Reeve playing, you know, the character, I, I said, you know, that's it. That is the Superman. And even to this day, you know, when I picture Superman, I, I picture Christopher Reeve, you know, in that position. I, I don't really think there's anybody that could compete with him or that will ever compete with him. I, I, I loved the storyline. I loved all the fight scenes and it was just, it was just an awesome movie. And it was just a nice movie that you could still to this day, grab a little bowl of popcorn and sit on the couch and just have fun with it, you know, escape for a few hours and just, you know, enjoy the movie. So that's, that's where my number 10 is at. And that was a tough one. You know, I was thinking of putting that a little bit higher on the list, but you know, after doing a little rearranging that came in at my number 10. Well, you know, there, there's so many films and, and I'm going to mention just like, and to add to a little bit to that, to me, I guess, because there is kind of an age gap between me and you. Uh, when I came in 1968, the first thing I was introduced to was to the George Reeves Superman, not the Christopher Reeves, but the earlier Reeves. And I was also introduced to Steve Reeves playing Hercules. Um, to me, Steve Reeves, I always wanted to look like him as I grew up, which is so funny. <laughs> And the fun, and George Reeves to me will always be the true Superman. And I know what you're saying with Christopher Reeve, because I did get to like Christopher Reeve. Um, I got a little turned off with Christopher Reeve later on, I guess, because he started turning to the Scientology thing, and it kind of turned me off a little bit. But the thing that turned me off about that film is when he spun the Earth the opposite way. But I do agree with you. Yeah, that's it being the best Superman film I think they've ever made. Oh yeah, there was there was definitely some some craziness in it, but you, you know if you you read the comic books, you know you'll find one or two of those comics, you know yeah. every year that they were produced that it just had some out of this world stuff. And you know if you if you sit back and you, you you think like a little kid and you just watch it and you're just like, oh my gosh, Superman just you know he flew you know opposite of the Earth's rotation and now it's everything's going back in time. I mean. You know, as we look at that as adults, it's kind of ridiculous. But if you could, you know, maybe think back to a well, five, actually, six, seven-year-old kid, you know, that's amazing. Actually, at the time it came out, I was a lot older than that. And I was kind of turned off of it because I saw that it was kind of a little. But you know what? That's that's who each. But you know what? In, in films, like, for example, I picked number 10, Earth versus the Flying Saucer, because I could watch that several times and not get tired of it. But there's also one in the same 10 category. I was debating which one to put, but there was also this island Earth. And the reason I like this island Earth so much was because the fact that a lot of the people that played in this island Earth, one of them was Charles Bronson. The other guy was uh, the guy that played the professor in Gellican's Island. So I, I found when I saw that film, I really loved it, especially when he's putting together the contraction and stuff. So I was stuck between that Earth versus the Flying Saucer. And I also was stuck behind, between a film called the final countdown that's where the aircraft carrier goes back into world world war ii and that was a fantastic film because i love that time travel films where it, that's what made one of my also greatest film which i didn't include in this list would be star trek 4 when they go back in time to save the whales oh yeah i think i must have watched that star trek over 40 times first of all the girl that played in there was phenomenal um, I thought that, the, you know, Captain Kirk and, and Leonard Nimoy playing that. And I mean, I'm sorry. Um, I forgot. A, <laughs> the guy who played Captain Kirk, what's his name? Um, Joe? Oh, now you're uh... now. Now I'm getting absent minded here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what's his name? Oh, what's man, it? I have to. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Here we like, are why can't I think film? about it now? What did you do? What did you do? <laughs> Oh, I, I, I William forgot. Shatner. <laughs> William Shatner. Oh my God, I can't believe I, I forgot his name for a second. Well, yeah. I was I was more used to Leonard Nimoy because I I used to watch. Yeah, you threw me off with Leonard Nimoy, and I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah. Wait a minute, no, 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 Leonard Nimoy <laughs> is the uh, Spock. But I'm saying I was growing up, I watched him more in uh in In Search of. So I got his name stuck to me. The other guy always was Captain Kirk to me. That was so funny. But anyway, getting back to what we were talking about, which I thought this was funny, the way we forgot here. 
And it was funny because for a second you kind of pointed on me and you forgot too. <laughs> so who do you have at your, who is your, what is your number nine position? My number nine, yeah, well, I was about to get there. My number nine film that I put on the list is High Plains Drifter. And that's the one with Clean Eastwood where he comes to a town and there's a small guy there, miniature guy. He's the sheriff or he makes him the sheriff. And I don't know if you if you remember the film. That's the one that I, I've never seen it. Oh, my God. That's one of his best. That's one of the spaghetti westerns. And that's the one where Clean Eastwood has the, the whole town painted red. <laughs> it's, it's a great film. You got to watch it. He comes in. He's got no name. Uh, he's like a stranger that just, you know, uh, waltz into the town and everybody's afraid of him because he just comes like really quiet and stuff. There's some bad people in town. I don't want to tell you much because I want I, you to watch it. I think you were it. telling me, I think you were telling me about this movie once before. And yeah, I, I, this film is, is probably, on my list. I love it. I love it. It's one of the best. Now, what is your number nine? So it's right. like I messed up number nine already. <laughs> All right. My number nine is, now this was another tough one and. I initially had it as my number three, and then it went to four, then back to not back to nine. So, Night of the Living Dead, nineteen sixty-eight. This film is I, I see it, at, you know, several times a year, and I just I love the characters. I mean, it was, you know, directed and written by George Romero, stars Judith O'Day and Dwayne Jones, and it is. You know, to a lot of us horror fans, it is the moment when the classic period of horror movies ends and the modern, more contemporary period of horror movies begins. Uh, some I, people like to push it, you know, into the 70s with slashers, but this is kind of like, you know, prior to this movie, there really wasn't that much gore in movies. Uh, you could go back to the pre code time in the early 30s and 20s, there was a a little bit of gore, but Night of the Living Dead, I mean, it, it stands by itself, you know, in, in how it was made, the the special effects and everything. So that's kind of why I, it, it's a very dear movie to me. Uh, you know what? And I, I'll discuss this towards the end when we finish our list here as to why I, I was kind of not really into that film. In fact, I got to be honest, I think I watched it over 20, 30 years ago. I, I remember very little of it. I know my wife is a fanatic for that film and she's a fanatic for The Walking Dead, which I still cannot even get into. Um, but, you know, that's another little conversation we'll have at the end. There, and I'll give you why in, in my part, because we're both horror collectors. And, you yeah, know, I mean, that's, it, it's that's a funny thing. Right. Uh, and it's but, something that it's something that definitely uh, inspired The Walking Dead. But, you know, I, yeah. I watched the first maybe three or four seasons of the walking dead. And then it just kind of, I don't know. I got, off. Yeah. I got kind of old and I just, I didn't really care about the characters or the storyline anymore, but you know, I could always go back to night of the living dead and um, just that, that whole movie and just the ending of it, the, the surprise ending of what happens is it, it's still a shock. And I've probably seen that movie 50 times and it's still shocking to see how that movie ends. You know, it's kind of shocking. It's funny that you said that because uh, the guy who does The Walking Dead, uh, Nick Nicotero, he he's bought some items from me, and <laughs> I I don't want to really admit that I'm not really a fan. But <laughs> but here's the other thing. Um, when we go to number eight, okay, in number eight, I'm going to go back now to the '50s films that were iconic in their time, but also very. My one of my favorites, I'd say that I, that I really enjoy watching. One is The Bat, and The Bat is Vincent Price and Morgan Moorhead. I think that's how you pronounce her last name, Moorhead. Now she's the one that played the mom in Bewitch. She was very young at the time, and The Bat was played by Vincent Price, and it's kind of like a detective slash murder story mystery. But if you watch it, you you'll really appreciate the film. Um, Together with that, I don't want to tell you number seven because you're obviously going to say number seven first, but it's tied in to the number eight film and why I liked it. What, what's your number eight? Okay, my number eight is Jason and the Argonauts from 1963. That is, in my opinion, and it's another one, man, that I just, I, I wanted to put it higher on my list because I, I absolutely, you know, love the movie. It is... You know, I think one of Ray Harryhausen's, you know, best Better. films because he mm -hmm. he did all the uh, 
the stop motion animation on it and and i don't know if there's anything more iconic than the skeleton fight scene i, I mean i think everybody everybody knows even if you haven't seen the movie i think most people you know have seen that that scene somewhere and just the time you know i mean if anybody out there has ever really looked into stop motion animation in the life of Ray Harryhausen, just how much time had to be put into the scenes um, and then working with the actors. I mean, it, it's absolutely amazing. So, you know, it, it's something that's another film that's very yeah. dear to me just for the amount of, you know, not only because it's a great movie with great special effects, but just the amount of work that had to go into it. You know, it it's kind of funny that you're saying that because, Quite frankly, I do agree with you on that. It's it's a it's a great film. I one thing I want to throw to you that you probably, I never told you what I didn't even know you liked that particular film. But I have a an original nineteen fifty something poster. It's a French poster of the fight scene with the skeleton, and it's actually fifty seven inches by sixty three. It's oh, wow. huge. And and that poster was several hundred dollars when I purchased it, um, you know. But anyway, that's another tidbit that I will we'll put out towards the end. But anyway, my my number seven now, because we're going now number seven is, which deals with number eight is the same actor, The House on Haunted Hill. Oh, I love with that. Vincent movie. Price. That that movie is phenomenal. I actually gone ahead and bought about seven or eight different copies of that film, um, and the reason for it is because it's 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 an awesome film. I think Vincent Price didn't realize it as a kid, though, even though I saw him in The Fall of the House of Usher and all that. And, and I've always the Raven because he did most of the Edgar Allan Poe films. And Edgar Allan Poe was one of those writers that in, in high school, my English class was almost the entire year based on him. And I got to really like Edgar Allan Poe and his writing because he had that always thing where at the end he kind of became senile, like the, the hideous heart, the guy with the heart that, you know, he kills the guy and he buries it under the I just enjoyed um I enjoyed him a lot and watching those films from Vincent Price as a kid I didn't realize what a great person he was until I was older and I started appreciating the genre more and I saw that he in, in, embodied several people a hypnotist a magician and an evil person I mean he is what I'm saying. If you look at his face and character, it's a perfect mugshot for any of the above. And one of the things I don't know, of course, this is something I don't know if you ever watched, but F Troop uh, was a funny show back in the 70s, you know, early 70s, late 60s, give or take. And they used to play it on the 70s. I don't know exactly what year it was produced in, but he made an appearance in one of them and he was kind of like a vampire figure and it, it was hilarious. But um, and then there was one particular um, show that appeared in the United States, even though in Canada it did like 20 seasons or something like that, some bizarre amount. It only showed up in the United States in the New York City area in 1973 for one season. And, and then it never showed again. It was called The Hilarious House of Frightenstein. I thought it was Frankenstein when I was young. And Vincent Price was the guy behind the voice. Uh, behind it and it was actually one actor one guy one canadian actor playing all the parts and it it never aired other than that in the united states i think it had to do something with the copyrights and stuff because it was very similar to you know dracula frankenstein universal but for some reason it only aired that one year and a lot of people remember it but nobody had seen seen it until recently a couple of years ago i was able to get um uh, DVDs of a couple of the shows, but that was, but anyway, that's why I always liked Vincent Price. Now that that's my number seven, the house on haunted Hill. What's yours? All right. My number seven, and this is another one that if you ask me a month from now might be number three or four, but my number seven is based off of Gaston LaRoe's 1910 novel, the Phantom of the Opera. And this is the 1925 version with uh, Lon Chaney as the the Phantom. And I, you know, for a silent movie, I, I know there's not too many, pe you know, silent movie fans left around. But man, this is, to me, the classic. I mean, just the unmasking scene still, you know, gives me goosebumps. 
And I agree with you on that. It's a very good movie. Yeah, and, and the set, and I've read a little bit into into the movie and the production, and I really want to do some more. But I guess the 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 set designers and all that actually went to France to get the original opera house there, and uh, they made uh, drawings and all that of the the actual opera house in order to bring back to the United States to to get it as accurate as possible. So their their attention to detail was absolutely amazing. And just the the pacing of the movie. And I know that when it first came out and they they gave it to uh, they put it out for test audiences, a lot of the the audiences, you know, they were booing at it. They didn't like it. So they went back and uh, they produced more, you know, some of the scenes. They cut some of the scenes out. And I think they went through three or four different cuts until they finally went with the one that we know today. And. I, I still think it's fantastic. I mean, just the Phantom of the Opera, the book, the the movies, uh, even Andrew Lloyd Webber's play, you know, anything with Phantom of the Opera is just it is phenomenal. And, and I love watching, you know, all those different movies and collecting Phantom toys and anything with it. So yeah. that is my number seven. It's funny. I'm going to add to what you're saying. Um, for some reason, I don't know why, uh, when you grow up in an area, uh, my mom worked over 35 years <laughs> across the street from the Empire State Building, and I never, I never went into the building, right? Except one time that I walked across it, and I'm like, I'm inside the Empire State Building. I'm one of those guys that never visited the Twin Towers uh, when they were up. I was going to go one time, and I chickened out from going up there because I'm afraid of heights. Um, the Statue of Liberty I visited when I was 13 years old, and then I went again. I think a few years. J- just I went. The last time I was in the Statue of Liberty was basically one week before the the attack on the Twin Towers. That tells you how many years ago that's been. Now, but anyway, I, I just thought I I bring that in because sometimes growing up in New York. Or what I meant to say and bringing the story in is that I never went to a Broadway play. And I had thought recently about going to the Phantom of the Opera because they told me it was an awesome play. And, and I just want to add to your film there. Well, that'd be amazing uh, to go see on Broadway. Yeah. But I just meant to say the story I meant to, that you live in the place. And you, that's my, my the moral of the story is you never go to the places that are next to you. Yeah, People really. from other states want to go to Broadway and they don't. And I could go anytime and I never did, you know. Um. Well, if you do end up going, make sure you get an extra program for me. <laughs> well, no, well, definitely. It, it's, it's just interesting that, you know, that it's been there so many years and I I put it on my plate to go, but I just haven't. Now, the other thing, my son has gone though to plays. I, I, I just never have. Now, number six for me. Now, we're going to number six. Five and six are kind of in the same category. I, I didn't know which one to put first or second, but number six would be, would be Forbidden Planet. Now, Forbidden Planet, of course, I fell in love with Forbidden Planet later on in life. I didn't watch it as a kid or that I can recall watching it as a kid. But I like Forbidden Planet because obviously Robbie the Robot was on it. And to me, he's my favorite robot. Again, when I first saw Robbie the Robot was not in Forbidden Planet or he made a couple other films. I think he made another film. Uh, I, I forget the name now, but it's something with the Runaway Boy or something like that. I think it's called. Cool. Uh, The problem with him is where I met him was in the Battle of the Robots in Lost in Space. And what happened was that he played the part there, the robot toy. And since at the time, you know, he was a bad guy, he kind of scared me a little. And because, you know, I'm a young kid and I'm watching the two robots. So I remember putting my feet up in the couch because I didn't want it to touch the floor when they were going (laughs) to battle. So I was afraid of Robbie the Robot. But later on, I realized how cool he was, you know. It's um, still a very iconic robot, too, to, yeah, even yes, to this yes, day. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. And now, if, I'm not, went... if I'm not mistaken, uh, Walmart put out some toys or something of Robbie, didn't they? Yeah, sure. I don't know if I mentioned to you. I bought about seven of them already. <laughs> bizarre, man. My wife is like, why are you buying? And I go, I don't know, man. The price still... was right. I bought seven of them. And I also bought... Uh, uh, one is called the Iron Giant, which is the same thing. It's about they're like 18, 20 inches tall, so they're really big, man. And they walk. To, now I bought the Iron Giant because you know he's a cool looking robot. I really did enjoy that cartoon. I gotta admit, though, um, I thought it was a phenomenal cartoon, and it's kind of based on real film, on real life films, like you know the day the Earth stood still. But anyway, 
What's your number six? All right. My number six is King Kong from 1933. Uh, if anybody knows me or if they're on my Instagram account, and uh, you can even see a bit of it in the uh, the upcoming video that will be on House of the Unusual's YouTube channel where I'm, I'm filming. You can see in the background I, I have a huge collection of King Kongs and, and gorillas because I, I absolutely love gorilla movies. Uh, you know, when a lot of the comic books, even of the 50s, they, they had a lot of gorilla covers. So, but... Bringing it back, King Kong 1933 is just, I, I think it's its a flawless movie. I mean, Fay Ray, Robert Armstrong, they were both fantastic in it. You um, know, I, I, I got to agree. The film, <laughs> I like that film, not just really, to be honest with you, that I watched it many times. I watched it one or twice, maybe three times. But I like the film because of the way King Kong looks and it's laid out. In fact, when I was a kid, I purchased this poster that I, during the fire in 1995, I lost it. Actually, somebody went in and stole it on me. Uh, some of the people that were cleaning the storage facility from the fire. And it was a six foot. It used to be sold in Famous Monsters at one time. And it's made on a very heavy uh, pa- vinyl type of paper. Uh, but it's six foot by six feet. And it's huge. And it uh, pictures King Kong with, instead of holding Fay Ray in, in the one hand, he actually has both hands up in the air, uh, which is phenomenal. And, and you know, I, I got to tell you a little thing that's kind of funny. I have, I believe, I don't, I, be, I, I just don't remember where it is right now, but I know I have a, an autograph, or not an autograph, but the actual letter that they sent Fay Ray for the contract for that film. Oh, wow. They send it to her. Somehow I obtained it. Um, it's in my possession. It's either my best friend's or mine, but I remember having that. And um, I can look for it to show it to you because I didn't know you like King Kong that much. But And I also have like two original Aurora Monsters, King Kong, sealed in the box, you know. And oh, I have one built. Uh, I mean, it's a great kit. It looks fantastic. Mm-hmm. I have, if you go to my Facebook, I have in the background, I have the the King Kong with the Hands up in the air there. It's it's I'll, it's, I'll have to I'll have to check that out, man. I mean, just the anything King Kong is just is just tops in my book, man. Like I well, said, it's just well, one I, of those things, man. It's I well, I I can tell you, I, I love the the photograph of King Kong, and that was my favorite poster. Now, heading over to number five, we're halfway down. The one I put in number five would be the day the Earth stood still with John Rennie. Uh I was one of those people that was able to get one of his autographs. Of course, not when he was alive. I bought it when he was dead. I I actually paid a good amount for it. But John Rennie, I think, played that part where he comes to the woman and the little kid and stuff. And I think the movie is phenomenal. I I must have watched it over 10 times. And I love it. It's it's super great. It's a well-done film for the time. It makes you feel like it's a futuristic film done before it's time, you know, or after it's time. But anyway, that's my number five, which is yours. All right. My number five, and I, I kind of cheated on this one. I added about, I added three movies. Now they're three separate movies, but they were all filmed uh, at the same time. And they were divided up into uh, three movies that came on 2001, 2002 and 2003. So it is the Lord of the Rings, the fellowship of the ring, the two towers and the return of the king. And this was another one that I, I wasn't sure where to put because I wanted it a little bit higher, but I felt right in the middle was perfect. And, you know, I, I'm a huge Tolkien fan. I, I've read, you know, all his books, his his uh, History of Middle Earth books. I've seen the cartoons, the movies, you know, very excited about, you know, Amazon Prime's upcoming show of uh, Lord of the Rings. I believe it's set in the Second Age. Mm-hmm. And I'm currently working on an article on uh, some monsters on of Tolkien's world, which I, I really can't get much into. But that, but yeah, the Lord of the Rings movies they're they're fantastic, and I the only ones I watch are the extended cuts. So I could sit there for nine hours and watch all those movies, grab a bite to eat, and watch them all again. I, they are. Just I, I think fantastic. And I know they don't really follow the books too much. They they deviate a little bit 
um, you know, for cinematic purposes. But I mean, if I, I, I think when the movies came out, that a lot of people that didn't know anything about Tolkien's world were drawn into it and started buying the books and started getting more uh, into his literature. So I think that was, you know, another good reason that the movies came out. And I mean, they're just fantastic. And one of the only scenes in a movie that ever chokes me up is in Return of the King when Aragorn's, you know, he, he was just been crowned king and he approaches you know the 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 fellowship hobbits the four the four hobbits that are there and they're bowing to him you know they're showing their respects to the king and he goes my friends you bow to nobody and everybody bows to them as they're standing there to me that's like one of the most touching you know scenes in in cinema it's and it's really it's really rounding out the aragon character and showing you know that not only is he a warrior and a, and a leader, but he's he's not arrogant or anything. He's not prideful. He's he's just a guy that was put in a position, you know, and he's he's trying to do the best. And, and just a characterization of of all of the 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 people in those movies is just phenomenal. So, um, and and I used to be a part of the the Tolkien um, Historical Society that's based out of. Um, I believe it's based out of London. It's been a few years since I've been a part of it. So I was able to really dig into a little bit more of the, um, the backstory and how Tolkien developed these, these characters and these storylines and the creatures and the different lands and everything and, and how it all related back to his time in the military and, you know, how he developed his own language to, to add into his story. So it's, yeah, so it's really phenomenal. You know, um, this is going to make you laugh, but I, I've never watched The Lord of the Rings. My son loves the films. My daughter, too. I think the reason I never watched it is because my daughter forced me into watching my oldest daughter, uh, Harry Potter. Oh. And after watching three or four Harry Potters, it's like I, I was not into the film at all. Uh, I didn't really like them. I watched them kind of like where I finished watching them I was not disappointed but I can't say I'm going to sit down and watch it again you know well there, there's um, no comparison I mean Lord of the Rings is just I, I do understand oh man I mean it's uh, it's so many steps above and I've never watched Harry Potter and I probably never will <laughs> I don't I, I mean that's that's yeah, what but... turned me off it turned me off from watching Lord of the Rings but uh that's I mean I do understand where you're coming from because I've heard even uh Laura Legends mentions that she just bought a a set of the Lord of the Rings and stuff. And I'm saying to myself, one of these days I'm gonna have to actually watch the films. Absolutely. Um, All right, so now, what's your what's your number four? My number four is of course going back again because I'm I'm a little older and stuff. And my number four I would say would have to be Dracula, the original nineteen twenty nine version with Bella Lagosi. And that's because it's a very simple film. It's not the greatest film in the world, but I, I just think it's awesome. And I grew to love Bela Lugosi as Dracula because of one of the films I'm going to mention soon. But um, that would be my number four. How about you? Okay. Well, that one actually came That's 1931 <laughs> that, uh, the oh, Bella, sorry, 31, that yeah. came out, directed by Todd Browning. And there was actually when they were filming that they did that film during the day and at night, the the Mexican version filmed. So there was actually two movies put out at that time that the, the yeah, but I think one it, and I'm the sorry. Mexican one. And a lot of people really think that the Mexican one was a lot better than the American version. Uh, really due to the, uh, uh, the way that the camera was and um, the way that the acting was. So, but well, go ahead. No, I was going to say, remember, though, uh, in 1929, I think when they were the play was. That's why I, I got lost there with the year. But I believe the 1929 when Bela Lugosi played the part in Broadway. Yeah, he was on the Broadway plays. During right. The, time, yeah. the film came out in 1931, but the original drag, I think, is 1929. Unless I'm wrong with this, you can correct me. Um, now, I don't know if there's any. I don't know if there's not that I'm aware of that there was any of the Broadway plays uh, filmed. I don't know. It's maybe something I have to look into. I've never heard of anything like that because I definitely would be interested in seeing him on Broadway. But um, no, I, I don't think I, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure. I, maybe, maybe there is some film I've never 
Now come to think of it, I've never, never thought about it. I know what I'm saying is he played in the Broadway play and then they made a film, not of the, but they made a film of him cast being cast as Dracula right. in 1931. What's your number four? All right, my number four is Captain America Civil War 2016. And the reason I, I this is a little bit newer movie, um, but the reason I picked this is because it really brought... I you know it, I'm, I'm a huge comic book fan. I, I love my comic books and my superheroes always have. So if anybody could remember growing up in the the eighties and nineties, you know, we really didn't have too many comic book movies. And if there were the movies, they were very, very cheesy and, you know, very low budgeted. So when Marvel kind of started with blade and then leading into iron man, they were really putting in the money for the the Marvel movie, so you know all of us fanboys on it, we all got excited. But the reason why Captain America: Civil War stands out is because you know all these great characters were brought together, you know, for that huge airport fight scene. Uh, then you had the the battle at the end with Captain America, Bucky against uh, Iron Man, and you've seen a lot of things that were going on in the movies. And I'm like, I remember seeing that in the comic book, you know, and, and I said, man, this is just, it's, it was like being a kid again. It was like my comic books were finally coming to life and getting the treatment that they deserved. So Captain America, Civil War, just seeing all these characters together and, and fighting and, and the whole story was just fantastic. So yeah, I, I, I got to agree. Number four. I, I got, I have to agree with you because uh, even uh, Iron Man was an awesome film, you know? Absolutely. Uh, now, Going up to number three, I will tell you something. It's uh, Frankenstein, obviously. <laughs> awesome. My my love for Frankenstein is quite simply because of one reason. Boris Karlov was in it. I think the the creature he played was phenomenal. Again, uh, growing up, seeing the seven foot Frankenstein in comic books and stuff, and again, one film uh, destined me to love those monsters forever, and that's why number three w- would be Frankenstein. All right, my number three is The Empire Strikes Back from 1980. Um, this, I, I believe, is, is a fantastic movie. And it's the first, I believe, Star Wars movie that I, I, wa- I remember watching. And it, it just, it, it has everything in it. It has a great story, has great special effects. And... You know, when I was young and I was probably seen it about five or six, you know, being that it was the second one, I didn't really know too much of what was going on in the movie. You know, I didn't know who these characters were, you know, what their relationship was. So it, it kind of took me into my my late teens or my my mid to late teens to, you know, finally see all three movies together. You know, when I got them on VHS and really understand what the story was and it really made me a lifelong Star Wars fan. And it's, you know, another um, genre that I, I collect a lot, a lot of the, the older figures, magazines, posters, you know, anything I could find of Star Wars. Um, I, I'm not going to say much about the uh, the prequels or the, the last three movies that came out, but the original three were were excellent. But, you know, the second one that was produced in 1980, which is actually episode five, uh, was in my opinion the best okay uh what i can say about star wars is i was one of those uh lucky kids that walked in the movie theater when the movie was playing the original one in 1976 um i was into star wars as it, uh, you know as the time went by i grew out of star wars i have an original 400 foot sorry 200 foot Super 8, I think it's a color film, or I think it might be black and white. The box is color for the of the Star Wars original film. Um, I own quite a couple of the original characters, probably worth several hundred each. But I got to tell you, it burned me out. Never bought Star Wars again, you know? Yeah, you know, they, they really kind of flooded the market. And I could see from a you know, I guess an economical standpoint of, you know, the stuff selling. So, hey, let's keep putting out more and more. But, you know, as collectors, we all started getting burnt out, you know, starting with the sequels and then when the, or I'm sorry, the prequels. 
And then when episode uh, seven came out, they just started really flooding the market with, with stuff. And I, I couldn't keep up. And I said, you know what? I said, I, I'm not going to put my my time and my effort and money into this new stuff. I'm just going to I'm going to stick with the original three. And if I see some stuff that I like, you know, some action figures or, or play sets or whatnot, you know, I'll look at buying those. But just, there's just too much new stuff out. And a lot of it is so cheaply made and it's just it's kind of like they just made it to put out there and they knew it was going to sell a lot so that's why they they threw it out on the market and yeah i just kind of stayed away from that a little bit i i got burned out with star wars a long time ago i just don't care for it which is so funny um well let's go now in the list here my number two which probably influenced everything and i'm going to actually put this in two parts because the best one that I ever saw that made me who I am today, basically as collecting, would be Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Oh, that is such a great movie. Okay, and the second one that I'm going to add to a number two because I, I I couldn't have, I couldn't just pick one over the other would be Abbott and Costello hold that ghost. Um, both films I could watch a million times. I love both films. I don't know if you ever saw Hold That Ghost. Yes, I I believe I I seen it once many years ago. It's it's hilarious. I love the two films. Like those are my two top films there, you know. So I, I number two has two parts. Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein and Abbott and Costello hold that ghost. And and that's that's such a fan that's actually one of my honorable mentions, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein and one of the main reasons cuz you know Bela Lugosi's in it as Dracula and that's my my all-time favorite actor, my all-time favorite character. Well, and just that whole movie is just, that's, I mean, it, it's, it's great. I mean, there's, there's nothing more to say about it than it's Yeah. Just, well, that's, that's what I'm saying. That's what made me love the other films too. Now, what is your number two? All right. My number two, now this might throw everyone for a loop because it's really a different movie than what we've been talking about. But I, I absolutely love nostalgia and I love Christmas time and, and even more than Halloween, and I'm I'm a horror fan through and through. But to me, I you know Christmas always brings back those memories of you know being young and waking up and trying to catch Santa Claus. But you know he's already there, and you get these you know gifts and toys, and it's just a a, a more peaceful and more innocent time that I you know I really like to draw back to you know during the winter months and, and really think back to. So my number two is a Christmas story from 1983. Yeah, I've and seen it. I've seen it many times. <laughs> that is just a fantastic movie. I'm a huge Red Rider fan, so I was initially, you know, drawn into the whole premise of the movie of him getting a Red Rider. I actually have an original Red Rider from I believe it's 1934. Still has the the leather, leather strap on it. Um, I have a lot of Red Rider comic books. I, I love the Red Rider uh, serial cliffhanger. So I was immediately drawn into the red rider theme and then also the the nostalgia aspect of it it really you know brought back that 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 time in my life that was more you know it was more easy going you know you were a, a kid four five six years old and you know your whole re, your whole world revolved around christmas you know when you started the new school year you know it was christmas countdown then after christmas you're like well i can't wait for christmas you know again that was the center of every childhood you know, when you when you were a little kid and you worked all year to make sure that you were good because Santa Claus was watching out for you. And I, I just love everything, you know, about Christmas, the cartoons, yeah. um, you yeah. know, the the old style decorations, you know, putting up a, a Christmas tree, you know, the smell of the pine in the house. So the Christmas story is a, is a very, very dear movie to me. And every year, you know, much to the chagrin of my wife, I watch that movie on Christmas Eve to Christmas Day nonstop when it plays <laughs> 24 hours on um, what is it TBS I believe and and I watch it as much as I could. <laughs> the the uh, yeah. my wife loves it too. They watch it all the time. The the thing that's interesting about that whole film is that the film itself is based more like in my time when I was growing up. Because uh, it's an older film and it resembles very close to the early seventies, um, but you know, going from there, my my number one, ready for this, is gonna throw. It's again a modern film, but it's got to be Pirates of the Caribbean. 
Oh, the, nice. The number one because it 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 makes it uses every part in the film of everything I like from treasures, pirates, pirate ship, ghost, skeletons. <laughs> There's not a part of the film that I don't like. It uh, is a fantastic film. I. Uh... So that now I'm like, man, I should have put that in my honorable mention. <laughs> yeah, that to me is is the number one of all. In fact, I bought several copies of each of them, and I I, I mean, it's really really a great film. Um, I just I think it's fantastic. I love it. Uh, but what is your number one? And then we'll get into another discussion since we're almost about ready to close up soon. All right, my number one is Dracula from 1931 with Bela Lugosi. Oh, that, okay. That film has that is the film that started me uh, in into classic horror. Um, when I was about six or seven years old, um, I knew nothing about you know classic horror movies or anything like that. So this would have been around mid 80s. So I remember. I was always, you know, I, I always liked Halloween and all that, you know, dressing up. I liked vampires. You know, of course, everyone knew about vampires. So I remember seeing a commercial on TV about um, this black and white Dracula movie coming on at one in the morning. And, you know, being five, six years old or whatnot, I couldn't stay up that late. And I remember begging my dad, hey, could I, I want to watch this movie and this and that. He goes, you know what? He goes, you go to bed. He goes, I'll wake you up before the movie starts he goes and you could watch it so i went to bed and he woke me up a little bit to, to 1 a.m and i had a bowl of popcorn and i remember laying on the living room floor with those old style uh arm pillows and me my mom and my dad were in there and you know they played this this classic monster movie and i was that was it i i was i was hooked i, I was addicted <laughs> to it man and you know i I was addicted to the classic movies. I was addicted to, you know, the Dracula character and especially to Bela Lugosi. And that was everything. Everything started at, at that point, you know, for me, I, if I, I don't know where I would, if I would even be a fan of classic horror, if I had never seen Watched that movie. Film. Right. And, and how it was at that time that, you know, how big of a part, you know, my parents played into, you know, my love for that, that genre, because I mean, you know, they didn't have to, you know, wake me up at one o'clock. They could have let me sleep and I would have, I would have slept right through, you know, but, you know, I got a chance to, to watch it on TV and our, our, our humongous 19 inch, you know, 300 pound TV at the time. And it was just, it was fantastic. And I have, I have several copies of that movie and I have probably seen it 200 times, you know, if not more. And, Every time it's it's still like I seen it the first time, so <laughs> there could be nothing else but but number one for me, and that's why you know we said at the beginning my number one and my number twos, they those aren't interchangeable and they will never leave that the the that spot. So well, tell you what, this is so funny. Now in our in the you know the ending of the show here, we're gonna throw a couple of questions back and forth and and see how you know how our movies uh, stand up. Um, one quick question I wanted to ask you. Do you remember which is the first film that Clean Eastwood played in? You know what? I, I, I don't because I wasn't really a, good, a big, I'm still not really a big Clint Eastwood fan. Okay. So I have it, no it idea. It was the, the Creature from the Black Lagoon. That's the first time. Oh, you that's right. Yeah, that is right. <laughs> now, the other thing I was going to tell you is the reason, and this is kind of funny, the reason I don't like The Walking Dead was because as a kid, okay, I was uh, kind of a wimp when it came to scary films. In fact, if I saw, first I saw Abbott and Castell meet Frankenstein, and then, of course, I loved the film, but at the same time, it petrified me. It scared me, okay? So if my mom would watch a soap opera, which she used to love the soap opera that would be over at 10 o'clock at night. It was from 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. And it was WPIX Channel 11 at the time, I think. And if I put on the television or change the channel to Channel 11, I'm sorry. My mom was watching a Spanish soap opera, but, you know, I would turn it to Channel 11. I forgot what movie was on. If 12 Midnight showed up and the bell just rang bing, the first thing that would play on Channel 11 was Chiller Theater. 
And the moment, if they, if I got to see the Frankenstein with the lightning in the background in black and white, where there's a famous picture of Frankenstein, he's looking like straight, but he has this dark shadow coming from his bottom up. I mean, it's a be- it's it's the most famous Frankenstein photo out there of his face. I wouldn't sleep that night. <laughs> and it was so bad that I, I would run and look at the time. I was nervous to change the television so I wouldn't see that moment, right? So let's go a little further now to when we were talking about The Walking Dead. The reason I didn't like The Walking Dead is because even though I love horror and I loved it too, I mean, I loved the stuff. I would buy the model kits, everything that was under the sun for it. I had a fear. I was afraid of, of those monsters at night. So there was one film in particular that scared the biz- everything out of me that even to this day, I don't think it's a cool film. I really don't like it. And the one is, uh, there was Gargoyle. There was one with, uh, you know, the people that play Stuck, Starchy and Hutch. Um, I forgot his name right now. But when they did Gargoyles, that was kind of a really scary film for me. But the film that I would say is the number one scary film for me, even though that sometimes when you see the Alfred Hitchcock films, that there was a lady up in a set of stairs and you see some guy with a knife, but you only see the shadow and the knife stabbing. That kind of put a little bit too much fear into me that I just stayed away from that part of the genre. But the film that really scared the heck out of me was called Don't Be Afraid of the Dark. And I'm not talking about the new remake they did of it, but the original one. And it was this lady and her husband by a house. And in the basement, there's this thing in the chimney. And they tell her not to, not to you know, take the bolts off this plaque that's, that's supposedly closing the chimney. And she does. And then the small creatures that reminded me of the Mole Man from the original Superman series uh, with Superman George Reeves, the Mole Man, they kind of looked like that a little bit. And they would try to take and they would keep saying to her, we want you. And they were afraid of lights. Well, anyway, not saying much. That film destroyed me as a kid. <laughs> I, I stayed away from horror film like there could be no tomorrow. Yeah, I, I grew up and I watched Squirmal, the one with the, you remember it had a skeleton face and the yeah. the worms ate you. Uh, you know, I watched Jaws, of course. Jaws was one of my favorite. I watched um, Silent Scream, that it said terror so sudden that there's no time to scream. I watched a lot of them, but it did do one thing to me. Hated horror films since that time. Didn't watch any modern day horror films. I think they're just overworked overdone with the same stupid uh, uh, themes on them. I have have watched watched Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, I have a copy of them. You know, I I do. I have watched it. They were okay, but you know what? They didn't really, really appeal to me. So that's where my horror film slash whatever. But today I'm a fanatic for horror films of the 1950s and 40s. I love them. But that's why I wanted to tell you why I'd never watched The Walking Dead, because I think it was too graphic for me at the time. It's you know, it, it wasn't just that, you know, I didn't really mind the, the graphic stuff. And I, I'd rather watch a movie with, that has a better story than better graphics. But with The Walking Dead, it just, you know, and I was reading the comic and the same thing with the comic as in the TV show. It just got very monotonous and the same thing over and over. So... I'm- I just I kind of got away from it. A good example. How many times are they going to repeat Halloween? I mean, are you kidding? Right. How many copies of Halloween? It's the same garbage. The guy comes back from the dead. He kills people. At the end of the day, they don't kill him. If they kill him, oh, is he still alive? You know, honestly, I'm not. I don't care for them. You know Um, what? I I I like the like me. I like the the original Halloween movie. Um, I like the second and third ones, but after that. They just got very generic. I do like the remake that came out a few years ago with uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. I thought it was, it was a good, you know, popcorn slasher horror movie. But to me, I, I'm still a fan of the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Even even some in the 60s as well. I'll, I'll take those old classics over the new ones. You know, yeah, over modern day horror or slasher movies. Now, see, I I grew up in the 80s. So the eighties was a totally that's when, what's that? A totally different animal, man, from the seventies. Oh yeah, <laughs> I mean the eighties the were they were also like slasher movies. That was you know when they started becoming big. 
so I grew up with the slasher movies, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street, um, Friday the 13th. Um, you also had um, Demon Knight. You had Halloween. All, all, all these, like, you know, decade of decadence type horror movies. And, and I liked them. I, I liked them for what they're worth. But, you know, I now watch them from time to time. But, you know, starting in the 90s, it was just... It was like the same old stuff, and then it was remakes, and then getting yeah. into the 2000s, it was the same thing, and it was more about how much gore and special effects could we add, and eh, who cares about the storyline? Yeah. And, and you know, I, I like something that's a little bit more balanced, and I'll always take story over special effects. Actually, the the only the last horror film that I actually watch is because my wife watches it like ten times, Jeepers Creeper. Oh my god, she she burned that film out for me, but. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I, I like the original. I like the first one, and I even bought the um. Uh, who came out with it at the time? I think it was NECA. Came out with a really cool uh, uh, figure of the the character. I can't even remember his name. It's been so long since I've seen the movie, but I thought it was it was good. It was a different take on on um on like that genre of horror. Yeah, it, but it, it you know, when they start coming out with two and three, it, it was just it was the same old stuff. Yeah, definitely. Well, we're almost ready to wrap it up, Joe. Uh, we have about a little bit under two minutes. What I was going to say really quick, saying that if in modern day TV, one quick question, see you what your thing is. My favorite show that I actually, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of a little crazy with it, is The Blacklist uh, with uh, Jason Spader. James Spader, I'm sorry. Um, I've watched each episode almost six, seven times. <laughs> And when it comes out on usually when the season's going and it comes out like Friday or Wednesday, whenever they play it, I watch it like from there to the next week, uh, constantly back and back. My wife thinks I'm crazy, but the show itself is phenomenal. The only thing I got with this coronavirus thing is that the last normally every season is 22 episodes and mm -hmm. they had to stop at 19. But I wish they would have stopped at 18 and at 19 because they killed episode 19 by making it a half human, half cartoon. I think it was ridiculous. Uh, that 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 particular episode is the only one I'm ever going to say of the blacklist that I think it really stunk, and I I just wish they would have taken it out. They, even I hope that they redo it somehow. Um, destroyed it. I would have rather stayed at 18 episodes, even though that I was crying for the 22, and maybe yeah. this year for season eight because they signed the season eight, they would have an additional two or three or two hour episodes to make up. I would appreciate that more than what they did with that last episode. I know they were trying to do the best, but they should have just, you know, not done it. Uh, anyway, what would be your take? What's your favorite today? And we have uh, 45 seconds left. Go ahead. Well, my, I, I, I don't really watch too much um, contemporary TV shows other than unless it's something for comedy where I'm just relaxing. But if I'm saying if it was something more contemporary, you know, within the last, you know, 15 years or so, I think would have to be the, uh, Battlestar Galactica series that ran from um right. I believe it was 2000 it was 3 or 4 to 2009 um I was a fan of the original one from the 70s and I I really thought the series was done well the ending was uh fantastic and you know a lot of shows they they kind of screw it up at at the last few it, episodes it was and, a good show it was a good show yeah. I actually met a lot of the actors I met the captain a couple of them on Chiller Theater yeah, so um, it's it's definitely something that you know that I, I I revisited a few times, and I've actually been thinking about rewatching it again. But you know, I don't I don't watch too much contemporary TV shows. Like I said, unless it's comedy, you know, I, I'd rather go back and watch you know Twilight Zone or Outer Limits or you know something from the fifties or sixties. You know, The Monsters, <laughs> Adam's Family, uh -huh. Dennis the Menace. You know, uh, Leave It to Beaver, you know, stuff like that. I I'd rather watch those if I'm going to put my time into watching a TV show. You know, one that I've been watching a little bit recently, I just watched a couple episodes. It's Mr. Ed, the talking horse. That's pretty funny, man. Oh, I haven't seen that <laughs> in decades, man. I would love to see that again. Yeah, it's pretty I, funny. I, I've been meaning to, I've been, I just started back again with the Adams family. And as soon as I finish that, I'm going to start with the monsters. So, yeah, I, I bought uh, three seasons of the monsters. I have like three sets of it. And, you know, of the Adams family, I got two. Yeah, if um, everyone out there, if no one has seen those yet, go out and watch them. They're they're yeah. absolutely amazing. Well, Joe, uh, we got to close up now. So, uh, what I uh, I'm going to say for anybody, please log on to houseoftheunusual.com. If you like to be on our podcast, please drop us a line. 
Uh, we'd be more than happy to see and have new guests each and every week. And Joe, go ahead. All right, Eddie. Well, uh, just like to say thanks for everyone for listening and, you know, head over to the forum on house of the unusual.com. Check us out on Instagram and on YouTube and, you know, just have a, have a good time with us. So thanks everyone. Talk to you later, Eddie. Bye-bye, buddy.